Amen. Cool teaching tonight. A little bit different. Our priestly garments. Everybody say our priestly garments. Now, before we get into our Torah portion, how many of you have been receiving the Torah portion in your emails this week and it's got next week's? Okay, so if you don't get an email, see Josh. Raise your hand, Josh. Josh is hiding back there in the sound booth. See Josh and he'll make sure to get you on our email list, all right, for Friday night. But anyway, it has the Torah portion so you can read ahead. You say, well, Rabbi, I don't have time to read ahead. Then I would tell you that you simply have your priorities mixed up. Amen. So priestly garments. So before we get into talking about the priestly garments of the priest and the high priest, I want to talk also, I want you to remember that you and I in the kingdom of God under the new covenant are still priests. Every believer, as a matter of fact, is called to be a priest. And so I want you to see tonight, not just what was, but I want by the spirit of God, you to see what is today and what he's calling us to be because there are some contrasts and some pictures, and once you get them in your heart, can really uh, 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 increase your faith, encourage you in your walk with Yeshua, and show you a little more about what we're supposed to be doing and living each and every day His way and following Him. So let's get started. The privilege of priesthood. It is a privilege and was a privilege for the Levites of that tribe of Israel to be in the priesthood. They saw it as a great privilege. As a matter of fact, did you know that all the tribes, except for the tribe of Levi, received an inheritance of land and will, during the millennial reign of Messiah, receive an inheritance of land. But Levites don't receive an inheritance of land because their inheritance is the Lord. Someone say amen. amen. Listen to me. As believers we fall into that latter category, whereas our inheritance is the Lord. I don't need a part and parcel of land. I just want Him. Amen? And we're a part of a priesthood, and we're going to look at that, and being a part of God's priesthood in the year 2019 is a high privilege. It is a high privilege because a priest made intercession, made prayers on behalf of the people to God. And you and I are tasked with bringing this good news of Yeshua, our Messiah, to the world. To bring a lost man to salvation in their only hope. And that is the job of a priest. Amen? So let's get cranking here tonight. So we're starting in Exodus chapter 28, verses 1 through 6. This was our Torah portion. Now take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel that he may minister to me as a priest. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, remember we talked about what happened later on to Nadab and Abihu. Very sad story, amen? Eleazar and Ithamar. <coughs> and you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as a priest. Now, all this time, they're in the wilderness. It's amazing the stuff they brought out of Egypt. Amen? It is amazing. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. You ever see the old Ten Commandments movie with Charlton Heston? And, I mean, they've got the wagons piled full with kids and screaming kids, and everybody left all their stuff at the house. That's not how it was at all. I mean, they looted Egypt. All the wealth of Egypt went with them. The gold, the silver, the fine cloth, the material, the spices, all of that was with them. They were in the wilderness, man, but there was no lack. You follow me? So get this idea out of your heart that somehow they were in the wilderness poverty stricken. Man, they had more than they'd ever had before. It's part of the reason Father is so frustrated with their unbelief and doubting. <clears throat> And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe. Now, when you read things like this, a breastplate, an ephod, unless you see a picture, and I'm going to show you a picture in a minute, it kind of is like words that don't mean a lot. Like if you ask 99.9% .9 believers what an ephod is, they're going to look at you and kind of roll their eyes and like an ehu. 
I've heard of e-commerce, but what's an e-fod? <laughs> it's like not quite the same thing. So I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to show you just a picture. And then we're going to get into the spiritual aspect of this. So these are the garments with which they shall make a breastplate, ephod, a robe, skillfully woven tunic, a turban, a sash. So they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that he may minister to me as a priest. And he wasn't just a priest. He was high priest. Amen. Verse 5, they shall take the gold, blue, purple, scarlet thread, and the fine linen. And there's a great teaching just in those colors, which I don't have time for tonight. And they shall make the ephod of gold, blue, purple, scarlet thread, and fine woven linen artistically worked. Everybody say artistically worked. Listen, whenever you do something for Yeshua, do it with your whole heart. Amen? I get so tired of God's people just giving the Lord the worst and accepting the worst. And I know I'm not talking about making do with what you got. That's a good thing. I'm talking about when we've got the best to do or the best to make. I mean, we should do that. Amen. When we make music, it should be the best that we are skilled to do. Right. When you work with your hands next Saturday, when we're out there laboring a labor of love to build that ring. I mean, it's going to be with all my heart, the best I have to give as unto Yeshua. Amen? And that's how we should approach everything in life. Now, <clears throat> I want to show you from this picture the different pieces so you understand. The first thing right there is the turban. Everybody say turban. Fine linen. And the Jews felt like his turban was white and he wore the turban to atone for pride of his countenance, which is Psalm 10.4, by the way. So he had this turban on his head. How many of you know that we have a turban on our head as priests? How many of you have ever heard of the helmet of salvation? Amen? The helmet of salvation. That is our turban. That is our protection. Amen? And the mitre. The mitre is the gold plate that he wore right here. And it literally said, holiness unto yud hey vuv hey, or holiness unto the Lord. Okay? Listen to me. Even, this is going to blow your mind, but during the millennial reign of Messiah, the scripture tells us, I think it's Zechariah, that even the trash cans will say holy unto the Lord. Wow. Even the trash receptacles. Now you say, well, there ain't nothing holy about trash. Listen, if God has ordained something for a purpose, that makes it holy. I want you to keep that in mind. Amen? These right here on his shoulders were called lazuli stones. And these two stones were worked so that they were engraved with six names or six tribes of the Israel on one shoulder inside the stone. They engraved on the stone itself six tribes. And on the other shoulder, on the other stone, the other six tribes. Isn't that cool? Now check this out. This is called, this breastplate with the stones, that's called the breastplate of decision, also called the breastplate of righteousness. Wow. Well, isn't that part of our armor? Having on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. Now, what's fascinating is, man, and again, there's a whole other study about these stones, but these stones that he wore, they were called the Umin, Urim, and Thumin. Urim and Thumin. And these stones were literally beautiful gemstones, a different one. Each tribe had a stone to represent it. And each tribe's name was engraved on the stone. Twelve tribes, twelve stones. Everybody understand it? Now, something interesting I want to bring up to you here is that in Revelation, it talks about the foundations of New Jerusalem. And it mentions that within those foundations are some of these same stones found within it. So there's something cool about these stones. And it's fascinating, and this is just a free bit of information, something I've been studying out for a future message, but the white stone here called Bezel, okay, is from the tribe of Zebulon. And the tribe of Zebulon, it's prophesied from the tribe of Zebulon was the area of Galilee where Yeshua came forth. And remember that in Revelation, Yeshua promises to give us a white stone 
with a new name written on it that nobody knows. Amen? Some think maybe it's a bezel stone, and it's supposed to be showing that he came forth from that area. Something interesting. Now, what was really fascinating is this breastplate of decision, these stones, this Urim and Thummim, whenever the high priest would go before the, the, the presence of the Spirit of God and ask a question as to whether a yes or no, they would light up. One would light up yes, one would light up for no. Supernaturally. Okay? You ever play eight ball? Remember the old eight ball? You know? Who am I, you know, I remember being a kid, you know, who am I going to meet today? And you shake it and you spin. It was almost like that, except it wasn't eight ball. It was the presence of the Spirit of God. And they would literally light up the Urm and the Thummim. Fascinating, huh, by the presence of God. And then you look at the robe. The robe is blue. Everybody say blue. And it's the robe of the ephod, okay? The ephod is actually the apron-looking thing that's underneath the breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate of decision, okay? And this is the robe of the ephod. It's blue, which is the color of the priesthood, okay? You know the tzitzits, they have the blue strand. Why? Because actually the Father in the Old Testament actually made all of the Israelites priests as well. I showed you guys, I taught on that before, and then there's a scripture about that. Even the tzitzits they wore was to have a blue thread, which was a symbol of the priesthood. And then this right here is the ephod itself, the apron-looking thing. Okay, that's what the ephod was. Everybody see that? Then you have the sash. The sash was the belt. And then in his hand, he's holding the incense. You see that golden thing? I didn't make a, 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 a slide for it. But you see the golden deal he's got? That's the incense that he would burn, that the smoke from it would go up before the Lord. And that has a tremendous meaning that I'm going to teach you tonight in the new covenant with our priesthood, amen, that you and I are a part of. So that's just to help. Does that help you visualize stuff a little bit? All right. Why do you think the priests were to wear special garments? I want you to think about it. Do you think the Lord just wanted them to look good? Do you think he was concerned about that? Do you think that maybe he wanted them to have special garments because he wanted them to be set apart? Set apart. Amen? Isn't it true that you and I as believers in Yeshua are to be set apart from the world? And our special garments that we have may not be able to be seen with the natural eyes but they set you and I apart from those in the world. Does the scripture not say to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness? The world can't praise God. If you filled this place with lost people, they would look at you like you were crazy, like you'd just fallen off of Mars. Are you following me? Why? Because you're wearing a garment they've never experienced yet. That's the garment of praise, right? How about a garment of prayer? Okay? So you and I, we have a special garment that's not seen with the visible eye, but it sets apart, sets each of us apart. We're cloaked with the Holy Spirit. Amen? He abides in us when we gave our life to Yeshua, and He sets us apart, consecrates us, and makes us different. Why should we, as the modern priesthood of the Lord, look different? So that people will recognize there's something different about us because we reflect him whom we serve. If you look like the world and if you sound like the world, you might as well be the world. Amen. <clears throat> Listen, this is out of Exodus 28 too, And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother, for glory and for beauty. For glory and for beauty. What makes a garment holy? I already told you. Hey, what makes it holy is when God sets it apart for a significant use for his purpose. What makes a man holy? What makes a man holy? Because we are set apart by his spirit for a use determined by the Lord. Amen? Set apart, cleansed by his blood, and made holy. Most believers don't think they're holy. Thank God our holiness is not based on us. It's based on the fact he has called us and set us apart for a task and a use. We've got to stop seeing ourselves 
the way that we see ourselves, and we need to start seeing ourselves the way Scripture sees ourselves. Amen? It'll change your life. <clears throat> Exodus 22, And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother, for glory and for beauty. Everybody say, for glory. glory. For, beauty. for beauty. Now check this out. 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4. This is Peter speaking to the congregations of Messiah and to the women in particular. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses. Now it's funny, some people read that and they say, well, you see, you're not supposed to braid your hair, wear gold jewelry or put on dresses. That's not what it says. He's just saying that your adornment shouldn't only be that. Amen? But let it be the hidden person of the heart. Now, this is what you and I as the priest of the Lord need to be wearing. We need to wear the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. Everybody say gentle and quiet spirit. Oh boy, there's some believers that need to hear that word. Gentle and quiet spirit. Quiet spirit. You don't have to talk all the time. You don't have to hear yourself talk all the time. Amen? Matter of fact, if you're talking all the time, you're not listening. You're not hearing. You're just talking. Amen? Which is precious. Precious. Everybody say precious. Precious in the sight of God. Gentle and quiet spirit. Wow, you mean God wants his people to be dressed in a gentle and quiet spirit and to be more concerned about the hidden person of the heart? Yes, he does. Amen? Yes, he does. So the priest of the Lord were to look different and to be set apart, to be consecrated. That's what consecrated means, to be set apart for a particular use. Am I right? <clears throat> Exodus 30, verse 7 and 8. Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. He shall burn it every morning when he trims the lamp. Remember that little thing he's holding, that little incense burner? Okay, so he's commanded to burn this incense every morning. When Aaron trims the lamp at twilight, he shall burn incense. There shall be perpetual. Everybody say perpetual. Do you know what perpetual means? It means all the time, ongoing, without ceasing, without stopping. Perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. The priests were to burn incense. What does that signify for us today? So when you read then the Torah portion, this is how most believers in America are. I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm just trying to get us to try to think deeper and see the picture a little better. We read that and we say, okay, well, they burned incense. That doesn't mean anything for my life. When actually it means a lot for your life because there's a picture there. Everybody say a picture. So what's the picture of this incense that they were burning? We already said that you and I were the priesthood, a modern priesthood. It's what the scripture says. I ain't say that. Yeshua said that. Amen? Know ye not that you are a holy nation, a chosen priesthood. Amen? Chosen to show forth his praises. So what does that incense represent? The scripture tells us that there is a symbolism here. There's a picture here. In Revelation, again, Revelation, chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing. Who was that? Amen. Everybody say, Yeshua. Yeshua. As if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, <coughs> each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of what? Incense. Incense, which are what? The prayers of the saints. Wow. So somehow, supernaturally, when we pray, our prayers are translated and stored, the ones that aren't answered right away, in this Bowl like of incense. That blows my mind. So what was this priest lighting this incense for? Because the Lord just thinks uh, the, temp the, the tabernacle didn't smell good? You know, we, we have these, what do we call them, uh, plugins out here. Listen, their incense and our plugins aren't the same thing. 
He was burning that incense because it was a picture of the prayers of the priest of the saints of God going forth day and night before the Lord for thousands and thousands of years and many of them being stored up. They're going to be let loose on that day to bring judgment to the earth and to bring the kingdom of God. Pray, Yeshua said in Matthew 6, Father, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Thy kingdom come. So when his kingdom's getting ready to come, all those prayers of the saints that have been stored up are kept in this bowl like incense. And he's fixing it up. Open it up. And here comes the answer. I love that. I love that. Amen? So when you read these things, they are examples for us. They are pictures for us. Ask yourself, Holy Spirit, what is the picture of the incense? What is the picture of the priestly garment when you read through the Torah portions? Amen? And the Holy Spirit will show you things that I hadn't even dreamed of. Amen? He was there and he's in you, and he'll show you and reveal this stuff to you. So today's priesthood offers up prayers as incense. Amen? I love that. Our praise and our prayers, it's like incense going before the throne of God. Isn't that a beautiful picture? How many of you love to pray? How many of you feel like you should pray more than you pray? We all feel that. Amen? That's okay. But listen, think about this. As you're praying, remember, your prayers are like incense rising before the Lord. I love that picture, amen? I love that picture. Almost done, guys. <coughs> you shall charge the sons of Israel that they bring you clear oil. Everyone say clear oil. Remember the Hanukkah story? Remember they had found, they had uh, uh, recaptured the, the temple and they had olive oil, but it, there was a process that took time to clarify that. They only had enough clear oil to burn it for one night. So they needed time, and that's why eight days it took to clarify the oil. That was the process. And then the oil was clarified. Once it was clarified, it was brought to the temple, and God did the miracle of the extension of the oil. That's Hanukkah, right? So when you read this, bring you clear oil of beaten olives for the light. To make a lamp burn how often? Continually. Now, when I read that, you already know what I'm thinking. I'm thinking our Brit Hadashah portion. Amen? Shall I read it in a minute? In the tent of meaning, outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall keep it, keep this light, in order from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a perpetual statue throughout the generations for the sons of Israel. That's why we light the Sabbath candles, because the menorah in the temple is no longer in existence. That light is not burning. So that's why Jewish people, they went to light the candles. Everybody understand that? So the priests were to take this very special oil and use it to make a lamp to burn continually. We said continually means what? Without ceasing. Holy Spirit is a special oil to fill our lamps, so that our lamps burn continually to give forth the light of Messiah. As a matter of fact, when the bridegroom returns, remember the parable Yeshua said that there was ten virgins, half were foolish, half were wise. The foolish ones had no wine, had no oil. What good is a lamp without any oil? And then there's all this argument, well, is the oil the spirit? Is the oil this? Is the... Listen to me, guys. The oil's what makes you shine your light. If you're not shining your light, I tell you, you're probably out of oil. You need to get with the Holy Spirit and figure out why. Okay? So you and I need to be shining forth His light. We are these lamps. And that brings us right to the Brit Hadashah portion of Matthew 5, 14 and 16. You are the light of the world. Who's Yeshua talking to? He's talking to His people. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. You are the light of the world. He doesn't say, well, you know, you have a high probability of being the light of the world one day if you're good enough and if you go to church and then you fall. No, he says, you are. You already are. You just need to wake up and realize you are. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. How many of you ever dropped Amarillo? 
How many of you know that on that long, I've drove in there at nighttime, and there's these lights in the distance, and I'm thinking, hallelujah, I'm almost there, Lord. And no, you're not. It's just the more you drive, it's like this optical illusion. You never reach it. It just is a light in the distance. And it's like, Amarillo, I know you're there. Come closer. Have you ever experienced that drive? You are the light of the world. You cannot hide a city it's set on a hill. can't be hidden. Listen, I had a pastor call me today. He's a new pastor. One of our congregations out there in Level Land. Never even been there. Level Land, Texas. And he and his wife, new pastors. And he called me up and he had some thoughts. And he just wanted to encourage me. He said, Pastor, he said, you know, he said, when I was going for my license, he said, something he said to me really touched my heart. He goes, I think about it all the time. And I, of course, you know me, I didn't even remember what I said. I'm like, well, what did I say? And he said, well, you said for, that the Holy Spirit wanted to use me as me, just to be me, not to try to be somebody else. And I was saying, well, you know, that's, that's a true word. Listen, every one of you are you. You're going to shine as a city set on a hill. For me. You're not me. You don't want to be me. Right? You want to be you. And as you, the Holy Spirit will use you to shine right where you're at. Listen, so many believers miss the boat because we're more concerned about how we're going to shine next year. One day I'm going to be in the ministry doing something for the Lord. Well, what are you doing today? Well, I'm not doing anything today, but one day in the future. No, it starts today. Today. Everybody say today. 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 Matter of fact, didn't Yeshua say not to take any thought of tomorrow? Well, last time I checked, that was still a true word. Amen? Amen. So when I hear believers just always consumed with tomorrow, I'm like, man, let's focus on, he's here today. You know, today. Nor does anyone light a lamp put under a basket, but on a lampstand it gives light to all who are in the house. There are some people in your house that need your light. There are some people you're around, some people you work with. Amen? Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. Everybody say good works. And glorify your Father who is in heaven. I would say if you have no good works, you ain't got much light. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your what? So they're going to see your good works, and that's how you're letting your light shine before men. So we need to have some good works about us, amen? Not just the Catholics. Amen? God bless the Catholics, but you know what I'm saying. We need to have some good works in our life. <clears throat> Is this not the work of the modern priesthood, to shine forth the light of the Lord in lamps filled to overflowing oil continually? Amen? Hallelujah. I'm going to close with this thought. <clears throat> Have you ever been in a bind where you were nearly empty of gasoline in your car, running on fumes. I'll never forget, I was a kid. I was working 35 miles away from where I was living. I was living in, uh, 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 where was I living? I was working in Stafford, Texas. I was living in Alvin, Texas. It was about 30 miles away. And <coughs> I was driving home one night. And I always had a gas, enough gas because I was working. I made sure I had enough gas. Money. But for some reason, this particular night, I didn't get enough gas. And back in the day, this 30-mile stretch of road had nothing. It was two lanes. One lane going this way, one lane going this way. And there was like no gas stations, no anything. And so I'm on the verge of running out. You ever have that sense you just know you're going to run out of gas? Were you ever a kid or maybe an adult? You just knew you were going to run out of gas. And so I'm driving and driving, and I'm praying and praying. I was a believer. I'm praying, Lord, just please let me make it home. And I even pulled over because I had this weird thought. Maybe I just need to believe God to turn water into gasoline and pour it in my gas tank. No, I did not do that. But I thought about it. Because, listen, I had nobody. If I was stuck, I was stranded. I would have had to call the police. I had nobody to call. Are you following me? I was just a little scrawny teenage kid. And so I'm driving, 
and by the grace of God, I made it home on fumes. Literally, it had to be a miracle. It had to be a miracle. Because I went so far on so little. Listen, that's how some believers live their lives with their lamps always running on fumes. Man, once you experience that, it's like, I don't want to live on fumes. That's a horrible way to live. Someone say amen. amen. I want my gas tank filled. I want my spiritual gas tank filled to overflowing. Amen. I've lived on spiritual fumes before, and so have some of you. Amen. amen. We want to be filled to overflowing. How do you do that? Realize you're in the priesthood, and every day allow yourself to shine bright for Yeshua. Fill me with your spirit, Father, in Yeshua's name. Not my will, but thy will be done. And allow your prayers to be as incense before him, and he will keep you filled to overflowing. Thank God. Amen?